God bless you, friends, and welcome back to Southwest Church Online. Ricky Jenkins here, and thank you so much for tuning in here at Southwest Church, where we are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we love discipleship. We're going to be celebrating all things marriage and singleness and divorce and sex. My, my, my. Let's get to it. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome to Southwest Church. Well, family, again, thank you so much for being with us today. We are going to go ahead and jump into God's Word. I'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 this morning as we continue in a series of study we're having here at Southwest Online that we call First Californians, Christ Over Culture, where throughout the year we'll be trying to bring an answer to this question. Look at it on screen with me. How do I live authentically Christian when my environment is authentically secular. So you'll remember that we've insisted upon calling our series First Californians because here in California where I am, we find so many similarities between that ancient city of Corinth and the modern day expression that is the state of California, which of course influences the whole country, which of course influences the whole world. It was Dr. Gordon Fee, uh, a great scholar who said that the problem was not that the church was in Corinth, but that too much of Corinth was in the church. And for all of those who say that the West Coast is the crazy coast, and of course, they're not far from wrong. At the end of the day, I would argue to us that the problem is not really that we're living as Christians in California, but that too much of California is plausibly living in us. And so today, as we go to our text, the Apostle Paul is turning his attention towards gospel marriage and gospel singleness to make certain that as we examine our singleness and as we examine our marriage, to use the metaphor, that there's not too much California in those institutions, that there is a lot more uh, Christ. And so let's go ahead and jump uh, to God's word. First Corinthians chapter seven, it's going to be on screen, but while you're turning, uh, those of you who are even online may want to connect with our marriage ministry. We call it cultivate, cultivate. That's the idea that marriage takes work to bring forth fruit, right? We call it cultivate. If you are watching right now and your relationship is uh, found itself upon dire straits. I want to encourage you to connect with us here at Southwest Church, our Cultivate Marriage Ministry. We have coaches that do marital counseling, premarital counseling. We come alongside husbands. We come alongside wives. Check out the QR code there. Go online to connect with a coach. We would love to serve you in any way uh, that we can. Let's go now to our passage, 1 Corinthians 7. Hear now the word of the Lord. Paul writes, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. I say to that, amen. And likewise, the wife to her husband, I say to that, amen. Again, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse five says this, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. 
For the unbelieving husband, verse 14, is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. The friends, I've read from the greatest book ever written. And I bear witness this day that all of its words are true. Amen? Amen. Let's jump right into this. It is obvious, just uh, even a simple perusal of chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. This is a serious passage, which, of course, calls for a serious message. So that's kind of going to be the tone of our time together today. It's a serious passage that calls for a serious message. I mean, questions abound that the Apostle Paul is attempting to bring answers to, right? I.e., sexual intimacy in my marriage. It is not going well. It is inconsistent. What does the Bible have to say uh, to me? Another question, how do I as a single person flourish in my singleness when my when, when sexual temptation has risen to fever pitch levels in my life? What does Jesus have to say to me? Um, I'm married, but my marriage has fallen upon dire straits. Can I check out of this thing? Can I drop some divorce papers or no? I want to know what the Bible says. And then fourthly and finally, look at this. Uh, The Apostle Paul says, hey, uh, we were unbelievers when we got married, but now I'm a Christian and he kind of still wilding out. Can can I leave this thing? What does God have to say to me? It is a serious passage. So we got to have a serious message. And so if you will allow me to just lighten the mood for the only four or five minutes that I can lighten the mood before we jump into what God's word has to say to you and I today. I'm going to do two jokes here, okay? We'll hope they'll land, uh, but I'm going to do one where women are, uh, if you will, the punchline and another one where men are the punchline or the butt of the joke. I'm going to do women first so I can really, you know, you know, get at the men after this. And then we're going to go to this seriously toned message that I think is so imperative for the kind of cultural moment we find ourselves in today. Uh, There was a store in New York that opened up that was called the husband store. And for the first time ever, women can go to the store and shop for a husband with all these sorts of options. So this one lady goes to the store and the clerk says, well, ma'am, this is six floors stores. okay? and we offer husbands here. uh, And so here here are the things you go from floor to floor and you can pick any item that you want, but only one item in some. Okay, and the rule is is that you can pass on that particular floor, but then you have to go up, but you can't come back down. Have fun, baby. She's so excited. Take her to the first floor and the husband store sign says all the men on this floor have jobs. The woman smiles. That's good. But let let me keep on shopping. We're going to the second floor because the second floor and the sign says all the men on this floor have jobs and love kids. Uh, She just tiptoes up to the third floor and that sign says all the men on this floor have jobs, uh, love kids, and they are terribly handsome. And she says, man, I can get into this sucky sucky now. But she's like, ah, let me keep on shopping. And she goes up to the fourth floor. That sign says all the men here have jobs. They love kids. They're extremely good looking and they love helping with housework. The woman said, mercy me, oh my goodness, I've never even expected anything like this. But you know what? There's two more floors. Let me keep on going up. Come to the fifth floor. The sign says, all the men here, they love, they have jobs. They love kids. They're extremely good looking. They love helping with housework. And they have a wonderful romantic streak. And they have plenty of money. And the woman is said, oh my gosh, this is exceeding, abundant, above all I could ever ask or even think. But if this is this good on the fifth floor, I can't imagine what's on the sixth. She goes to the top floor and the sign says, welcome. There are no men here. You are visitor number 31,843,456. This floor exists solely to prove that women are impossible to please. Okay, so all right. 
uh, email me at Pastor Ricky at SouthwestChurch.com. Okay, now, women, that was your part. Now, men, let's 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 go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, there was a woman who stumbled in the forest across a magical frog that had been caught up in a trap, and she frees this magic frog. And relieved, the magic frog says to the lady, I'm so grateful that you've rescued me. I now bestow upon you three wishes. But the caveat is this. Whatever you wish for, I will grant your way, but will magnify it your husband's way ten times. So whatever you get, you get, but your husband gets it times ten. So choose your wishes carefully. What is your first wish? The lady says, well, I wish to be the most beautiful woman. And the magic process, that's easy. You're now the most beautiful woman, but your husband's happiness, uh, handsomeness has been magnified 10 times. What is your second wish? The lady says, well, I, I wish I wish to be rich. I wish to be rich. And the magic process, congratulations, you are now rich, but your husband's riches have been multiplied 10 times. What is your third wish? The lady scratches her head and pauses for a minute. Then she looks at the, the frog and says, I got it. Um, I wish for a very mild heart attack. She wished the husband to die because she, anyway, anyways, okay, all right. Let's lighten the mood up, friends. Let's go ahead and get into God's word. Four questions I want to answer today. The first question is this, should married couples abstain from sexual intimacy? Number two, should single people feel pressure to get married? Thirdly, should married people get divorced? And fourthly, can married persons divorce a spouse who is an unbeliever? I'd like to tag this text a little Q&A. Let's pray. Jesus, fill us with your spirit and God, give us a thirst and hunger for righteousness. Father God, as you meet it out in the word, Holy Spirit, change hearts, touch lives, save marriages, save singles, encourage us, instruct us, correct us, build us up, Lord and help us to find holiness the way of Jesus. God, I ask it all in Christ's name and every heart said together, amen. Let's go ahead and go to the classroom for a few minutes. I promise we're going to church. But allow me to kind of give us a little contextual footing upon which um, our time together can be navigated by. I want to talk a little bit about the passage. Let me lay down a couple of rules for us first, guys. First, um, there's uh, no way that we can answer every question surrounding marriage in the short time and the short passage that we have here. There may be some questions you have about relationships and navigating singleness that will be left off of today's table. I wanna encourage you to visit us at southwestchurch.com and go in our sermon archives. Uh, Look up a sermon series entitled Cultivate. We've literally done four marriage series here. There's over a couple of dozen sermons on marriage and singleness I know will encourage you. So that's the first kind of rule I want to lay down. The second rule I think is just important when you're talking about marriage and singleness and divorce and sex. So much stuff is conjured up in our souls and I get that. So I just want to declare that today is a no guilt, no shame message. No guilt, no shame in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friend, all of us have made mistakes. I know I've made them. All of us have some things we wish we can get back. And so if your story is one that has a past like mine, I want to encourage you that Jesus Christ is the God who looks at you with grace and says, let's just concern ourselves with today and tomorrow because I'm not going to hold yesterday against you. No guilt and no shame. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and jump into it. There's a whole lot here. Uh, You'll kind of feel how Paul's it feels like it's kind of jumping from subject matter uh, to subject matter and, and not really delving too deeply necessarily into either, right? And of course, the question is why? Why does Paul kind of compose this passage the way he does? N.T. Wright, who I would argue is the world's brightest Paulian scholar, said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the content shifts from those issues Paul had heard the Corinthians were struggling with to those issues the Corinthians admitted they were struggling with. Translation, all he's doing in chapter seven is bringing, watch this now, concise and direct answers to exact and direct questions that they asked him to take on. You'll notice in verse one, 
how he, he gives us proof of this he says, now concerning those matters about which you wrote translation. The reason I'm random is because your questions were random and I'm just bringing you a biblically faithful answer in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the questions that you guys have surrounding marriage and divorce and singleness. So notice as he delves into what they were going through and what they were thinking about life and relationships, he says in verse one, it that, that they had said, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, stay with me. What is Paul exposing? Paul was exposing this notion that in the Corinthian church, married people, okay, who were in love with Jesus had begun to abstain from having sex within their marriages. And of course, the question is why? You know, a closer study will show that there were two prevailing concepts or schools of thought surrounding sex in Grecian culture. Uh, the one side uh, kind of looked at all things flesh and all things body as inherently evil and bad and nasty. And so these were people who said, since the body is just evil and we just want to delve into the spiritual and completely ignore the physical, right? Uh, that, that, that was a school of thought. So they had what we may call the ascetic view. Think asceticism or an ascetic, right? So when you hear ascetic, think removed and think denial. They wanted nothing to do with it. Well, the other side of the surrounding culture was what I like to comically call the trisexual view. And these folks would try anything sexual, okay? They were freaky freak. You know what I'm trying to say? Now, as we get into 1 Corinthians 7, it becomes obvious then that the Corinthian churches had ascribed to this ascetic view. They'd come to Christ. Their entire surrounding culture around them was completely sensationalized and just given to all things sex and perversion and immorality, you name it, the Corinthian people were doing it. And so there came this this tension within Christian circles to say, you know what, sex is just not good at all. So let's just be Christian and let's just love Jesus. And let's just figure this out. And they have let's have nothing to do with it. But Paul is exposing in our text that is a huge problem in the marriage covenant. OK, so Paul here just takes on their questions to give them a biblically faithful answer in light of who Jesus is and what Jesus wants for these institutions of marriage and singleness he has created. So, of course, we can see from the text and give conjecture as to what those questions might have been. I think the first one was, is this. Should married couples abstain from sexual intimacy. I'm going to read again. They literally said, should married couples abstain from sexual intimacy? Now, friends, let me give you the short answer. No. Short, short answer is no. But let's just read what God's word has to say. Pick me up in, in verse two. Paul says, but because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman, her own husband. Verse three, it is here as clear as day the Bible says the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. I just want to say right now to my wife, April, honey, I will obey God's word in this regard at every, at every chance. And likewise, the wife to her husband. The Bible says, for the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. The husband doesn't even have authority over his own body. The wife does. And then verse five, lest we, lest we had ill-conceived notions about what he's just written. Verse five, he says, do not deprive one another, okay? Now, for now, you need to know that this was groundbreaking stuff 2,000 years ago. Tim Keller said nothing like this had ever been said before. So in a world, watch this now, where women were literal legal possessions of their husbands, hear the gospel witness saying, husbands, you don't even have authority over your own body. Your wife does. He says the same thing to the wives. Ladies, you don't even have, once you get married, you don't even have authority over your own body. The husband does. Stay with me. Don't turn me off yet. He's saying two things here. First, Paul is literally saying that a marriage should not avoid sexual intimacy. You're, you're going through the throes of marriage and maybe it's the kids that got you crazy and tired or maybe it's the fact that y'all aren't connecting like you used to or Maybe it's the fact that there's some inclinations going on outside of the marriage that are causing trouble inside the marriage. But here the commandment of scripture, Paul says, when you avoid sexual intimacy altogether as a married man with a married 
woman, Paul, the apostle, says to us that that's not good, that that's not healthy, that this opens you guys up to some darker paths that you don't want to encounter, that Satan gets a foothold in the marriage when that is taken outside of our relationship. Now, I want to drop a word here because there's some couples who are watching right now for whom sexual intimacy is just not a reality for you in your relationship. There's physical limitations, okay? There, um, there are physical constraints, right? And so for some of us, this idea of intercourse and marriage is not even a reality. So I would kind of amplify this text by saying it this way. Paul is just urging marrieds to connect with one another on some level, okay? as consistently as you possibly can. And of course, the question is why is because the good news of Jesus is that sex and or intimacy between a married couple is God's wedding gift. God is saying, remember how sweet this was on honeymoon night, right? God is saying this is something that has the potential to strengthen the marriage and deepen the connection and make you both happier people while you pursue holiness one with another before Christ, okay? It is God's wedding gift. Those of you who are watching who have been married, you remember all your wedding gifts, right? Some of you got a toaster. Some of you got a punch bowl. You don't even know where it is. If you're anything like me in April, you got 17 crock pots, right? Some of you got a Hobby Lobby gift card. You know what God gave you? Sex. God's like, you are welcome. Come on, somebody. It is God's wedding gift to us. But secondly, big picture, principally speaking, Paul is saying that it's very important for a marriage to remember oneness, to remember oneness. The subject matter is sex, but the principle he's bringing this back to in his own way is that marriage is a partnership. Marriage, by definition, is not a solo enterprise, okay? It is, it is this idea that I am supposed to be one with my wife. My wife is one with me in all things. Stay with me, somebody. Jesus spoke to this in Matthew 19 when he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and he shall hold fast to his wife and no longer shall there be two, but they shall be one flesh. OK, so if April were right here, the whole idea is that once we say I do to each other, we're no longer isolated individuals. God says, in my eyes, you're now stuck together. So the only way you're going to be happy is if you pursue holiness by staying stuck together. It's oneness. And what's the implication of this? It means marriage is going to work not when it's my money, but when it's our money. Not when it's my schedule, but when it's our schedule. Not when it's my hopes and plans, but when it's our hopes and plans. And the land, the plan in the text, Paul says, and not when it's my body, but when it's our body together. And I just want to say this to my wife, April, my body is always yours, all of its beauty. All of, anyways, but so, so the whole idea is oneness. One of the greatest problems in relationships and in marriages today is that we have forgotten this vision of marriage that God has set forth in the world. We have forgotten oneness. And what I like to say is we put down God's oneness and we pick up our two-ness. And that's why there's a disconnect because marriage, the number is one, not two. And ours is a culture that elevates these ideals of individual freedom and autonomy and personal fulfillment to such high echelons, to such non-negotiable expressions, right? That we start to co-opt those ideals and think that they continue in our marriages. But there's no way that you can believe deep down that marriage means that I'm literally sacrificing those ideals so I can embrace this beauty that God says that apparently I will be better when there is one flesh than when there are 
two. This is the whole idea of what Paul says in the idea of our oneness. You're watching this as a married couple right now, or you know someone who is married. And I want to just tell you that when you show up like two, you'll never be one. That there comes a sacrifice of saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to think about me. I'm going to think about us, because when I think about me, it means I diminish you to some subservient role that you whereby you only exist to broaden and to deepen and to fuel my estimations as to what I should be doing personally and accomplishing in my own right. You become this subordinate feature to my goals to push me up. And that is not the heart of Jesus at all. And you're missing out on something. And then there should be the shared oneness. Amen. Question number two, should single people feel pressured to get married? Short answer is no. <laughs> okay. The short answer is no. Now, remember, this is all in the guise of sexual temptation. Okay. But see how Paul's focus is still upon personal holiness. Friends, when you hear holiness, think living like Jesus lived. And saying the things that Jesus wants us to say, doing the things that Jesus wants us to do. A couple of things here, which I, I think is really interesting. I think it's good for us to know that Paul, who's writing this passage, was himself single. Paul was himself uh, single. Now, almost certainly Paul would have been married before. You just got to know that. Bible show, tells us that Paul was at one time a Pharisee. It is quite plausible that he was also a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, this elite governing body that was headquartered in Jerusalem. There's a lot of biblical evidence that he may have been both. And everything we know about Pharisees and Sanhedrin would have insisted that every member be married. It was always almost seen as ghastly for a Jewish leader, okay, to not have been married. So we're almost certain that although Paul is single here, as he testifies to in the passage, would have been married before. Most scholars think that Paul's wife has either died and he is now a widower, half of scholars believe that Paul, once he became Christian, his Jewish wife forsook him and left him, which is interesting. And so far that later on in our passage, he talks about how you are to show up when your unbelieving spouse leaves you. So my point is that, that Paul himself was single. He is very qualified to tell us what he is about to say. The principle is housed in verse nine, okay? And here is the truth. As a single person, Paul said, who, for whom sexual temptation, okay, has reached a fever pitch. The Bible literally says, okay, it is better for you to marry than to burn with passion in the church that amen, because that's what the Bible says. It's Paul's way of saying, Listen, God loves you. God made you and wired you with those natural inclinations for sexual intimacy. So single Christian, if Jesus has called you to marry, then there comes with it this right of way to pursue those inclinations and desires within the proper construct of how God has envisioned it to be with a marriage to another Christian man, if you're a woman or a woman, if you are a man, two things to qualify this. Um, verse 39 says, if when you marry as a Christian, you should marry only in the Lord. Translation, Christians are called to marry Christians. OK, so I'm saying that because I said if you. <laughs> If you're out there as a single, you're a single guy watching this you, and you just heard, oh, thank you, Jesus. Better to marry than, oh, thank you, Lord. I get, you, don't, you don't get to go and just jump in, in, in Best Western with any Tom, Dick, and Hank. He's not saying that either, okay? So just because you're burning with passion don't mean you get to walk down the high aisle with one of hell's angels. Okay, fellas, just for you Christian man out there, you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, okay? You don't get to go to the Vegas Strip all right, and just pick up anything walking only in the Lord. But secondly, principally speaking, and I think it's the bigger word that God has to say to singles here is this. Remember your worth. 
in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's something bigger that we need to reflect on when we are burning with passion is to remember the contentment and the satisfaction and worthiness that only Christ can give us. Verses seven and eight, Paul reminds us that each person has his own gift. Translation, if you're single watching right now, God says to you, remember the truth of scripture. Singleness is not a curse that you can lament. Singleness is a gift that through Christ you can enjoy. That's the power of the gospel, that it is a gift from God. So much so that Paul says, it's good to remain single. And what's the lesson I think you need to hear in the way of remembering your worth? Christian singleness is just as beautiful in God's eyes as Christian marriage. Friend, when God looks at a married people, married person, he says it is beautiful. When God looks at a single person, he says it is beautiful. And I just want to drop a word to singles. You do not need another human being to complete you and make you worthy. Marriage does not complete you. Jesus does. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that marriage makes you better. A marriage makes you more acceptable. A marriage makes you more worthy. I've read the book from cover to cover and the book agrees that all are created in the image of God. All are children of God. All are loved from God. So your single brother or a single sister watching this message and I bear witness to you that if you've been washed in the blood of of the lamb, if you have been to Jesus for the cleansing found, if Christ has forgiven you of your sins and by faith you have come to Christ by way of the cross, my friend, you are right now and in every way as complete as you ever shall be. Hear this truth, singleness is not something broken that needs to be fixed. Singleness is something wonderful that deserves to be celebrated. Let me drop a word to church people and married people. Stop treating single folks like they're less than Christians. Stop, stop treating single people like they're, like they're missing out on something. John the Baptist, single. The Apostle Paul, single. Plausibly, several of the prophets, single. Jesus Christ, single. That there's a way, a path of fullness and contentment in Jesus whether I'm single or or married. Let me say one more thing. Single people are going to the same heaven married people are. Equal in God's eyes, amen? Question number three, should married people get divorced? Should married people get divorced? Short answer, no. <laughs> well, let me qualify it first. Now, there are biblically permissible reasons as to why a person would be biblically allowed to have divorce. Jesus says that one is adultery or sexual immorality. In our text, the Apostle Paul says the other biblically permissible reason is something that we in the church call desertion. So sexual immorality, adultery, okay, that makes sense, right? Desertion is this idea that if I'm married and my husband or my wife just leaves the marriage, forsakes the marriage through no fault, of my own, Paul says, I am free to move on. That is what he's literally saying. But again, here, it goes back to principles. So what is the Apostle Paul principally saying? He's saying that if you're married, you got to remember steadfastness. In other words, God's called you to this lifelong covenant. And I know hearing this in a culture, okay, where people are increasingly moving away from marriage, okay, Indeed, California is the least married state in the union. Um, I know it's hard because people make mistakes and there's so much going on in and around our relationships, but God has called us to steadfastness. See, marriage was God's idea and what God was thinking is that I put you two together to show what my steadfast love is like, that when people see you, they'll see what my love is like. And this is what I understood about God's love. When I didn't show up well, he still showed up faithfully. And that's the opportunity God says to consider beyond the tumult you may be experiencing in this moment of your life. There's some dear friends of ours, a wonderful couple, older couple, Hamp and Nancy Holcomb, uh, 
kind of like parents of me and April's back in Memphis, Tennessee. And I remember Hamp and Nancy had our small group and all of us sat down there and Nancy is there and they're talking about marriage. And Hamp looks over at Nancy and he says, you know, this marriage stuff is amazing because there are days when I look across at this woman and there's no one on this world in whom I can find more delight and wonder and love and compassion and romance. It is the most beautiful thing, and it reminds me of Jesus' love for me. But there will be a couple of days can go by, and the flesh gets busy, and I get warped in my spirit, and I look across at this woman because something's popped up in my marriage. And the same woman who I said there could be no wrong, I now look at and say, there's no one on earth I despise more. And he says, you can't tell me that this thing wouldn't come up with to remind me of my relationship with God. That there are some days where Jesus is the best thing <laughs> that ever happened to me. I am in awe and in delight and in wonder of who he is. Yet my flesh can get busy and two days later I can turn my back on him. But he stayed faithful. And so now when stuff goes down in this relationship, I copy and paste what he did for me into this relationship with her. It's this idea of remembering steadfastness. Now, don't hear me say, okay, that you are to put yourself in harm's way. And don't hear me say that you are to allow yourself to be unsafe. And don't hear me say that you get to endure unjust abuse. I am not saying that. In fact, if you're going through those situations, holler at the church so we can help you. Just hear me saying, if you're not careful, you'll start to diminish marriage to what the culture says it is, because the culture says it's a contract and not a covenant. And contracts means that when you don't do your part, I get to get out of it. But God says, when you didn't do your part, I didn't let you out. I didn't let you go. And so please, as best you can, apply that in your marriage. You guys remember uh, Montel Jordan? Um, this is how we do Montel Jordan he, he and his wife Kristen have been married now for 30 years guess what y'all Montel Jordan's a pastor now goes all around the country preaching on marriage and helping married people he and his wife Kristen say that you've got to be so serious about this idea of covenant that if divorce is an option for you you've got too many options he says, when divorce becomes an acceptable tool in the marriage, then it eventually becomes an acceptable weapon against the marriage. Remember steadfast. Let's go home on this. Can married persons divorce a spouse who is an unbeliever? Short answer is, you said it. No. Okay. Uh, God says, once you get married, you're married. When a man marries a woman, God says, you two are one flesh. That's what God says, okay? God's made up his mind in that. Now, it's important to know that Paul here is not addressing believers, okay? Like a belief, if I'm a Christian and I marry an unbeliever, okay? I hope that it is obvious that I understand that they're married, right? But he's specifically addressing the context of two people, a man and a woman who get married, and at the time they are both uh, non uh, Christians, but then one of them gets saved, right? And so one one's going down a different direction spiritually. They're in opposite direction spiritually. So they had asked the question, so Paul, you know, we was unsaved and then we got married, but then I got saved and he's still tripping and out there wilding out. So what do I, do I get to leave? And Paul says through the power of the gospel, no. And this is the principle that I think he's saying to you guys today. He's saying, remember, faithfulness, faith to believe that God can turn situations around. Holiness is again its focus. Paul is saying if you're saved, living and married to an unsaved person, Paul is saying that there's an opportunity to live like Jesus. Two reasons. First reason is it's because you're married and marriage is a lifelong covenant. But the second reason, as Tony Evans says, is the Christian husband or wife now has the opportunity to become a channel of grace 
for the unbeliever. Notice how the text says, even your children become holy. What does that mean? It's because there's a believer in the house. That means that God says, I'm going to work through that believer and I'm going to make y'all holy. Holy just means set apart. It means that there's a spark of hope in that house that you ought to ask God for faithfulness to, to keep on doing what God has called you to do, to love that person. And Paul says, who knows, wife, you may save that husband. Who knows, husband, you may save that wife. And so remember faithfulness. I want to close in just praying uh, for, for you as you consider all of what God's word you know, says to us today. Uh, there's an old joke that says that marriage is like a three ring circus. First, there's the engagement ring, and then there's the wedding ring, and then comes suffering. And although that's funny, the truth is you're a married person or you're a single person out there, and there's some element of suffering surrounding these topics that we've taken on today. And at this issue, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you that Jesus sees you, that Jesus still has a plan for you regardless of how tumultuous your situation may seem, that he has his heart on the suffering and has a plan for you. I want to close our time to praying for you, Jesus. I pray for anyone who's heard this message. I thank you for the correction. I thank you for the conviction. But Lord, if those who are wincing in pain, God, as they consider what they're going through and the truths, God, that you have shared to them today, Lord, I pray that they would have relief. God, help them to show humility and help them to show love, God, amidst these diverse circumstances. Holy Spirit, I pray that they would be relieved of their pain and encouraged, God, to keep on doing what Jesus has called them to do. For I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And I ask this blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The church said, amen. I'll see you next time.